a lot of Australians are now thinking about, well, what life do we now live? Will we ever be free? What will happen to our children? And there are important principles which took centuries to establish, particularly through England and, and through European bloodshed, which have just been sacrificed within weeks. This week's specials with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments, Austrian Philharmonics, for only 365 over spot, Type 2 Silver American Eagles, for only 725 over spot, and Limited Mintage San Francisco Mint Type 2 Silver American Eagles, for only 725 over spot, sold in quantities of 500. Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We have a returning guest who is well anticipated by our viewers. We're speaking with John Adams. He's the chief economist at Good as Gold Australia. He also is the founder of AdamsEconomics.com. He's joining us from Australia this Thursday, September 16th, 2021. John, thanks for coming back on. Thank you, Dunnigan. It's been a, a while and uh, it's glad to be back on your show. Now, most people have been saying, where's John Adams? He's gone off. He's gone off the screen. He's gone silent. Where's John Adams? Where's John Adams? There are some very, very important and specific reasons why it's been hard to get you. First of all, I explained to people during a live chat that we've been unable to do these type of recordings with you, which you normally need to travel to Sydney to get the environment and the connection speed and everything to, to enable this videotaping because you were under basically house arrest for as you were contacted. And maybe you can give us a quick summary on why that happened, uh, that they kept checking on the making sure you were staying at home, that sort of thing, police showing up at your door, etc. And then today when we were scheduled to start this recording, finally, when you were able to get away, you you uh, called me up and said, could we start later because I'm having troubles with the police? And then you, you, you sent this out on Telegram saying that uh, you had, had been visited by the police at your house to make sure where were you and what were you about and what was going on. Very concerning. Uh, my wife and I were talking about it and, you know, Australia seems to be kind of leading the edge over the cliff of freedom to the abyss here in terms of the amount of government lockdowns and that sort of thing. Really concerned about what's going on for you and for others in New South Wales and what that might portend for others who are freedom loving in the world. Can you bring us up to date on, first of all, why in the world were you locked in your house by the police for 10 days and why were they visiting you today? Sure, sure. So um, a few issues to cover done again. So the first one is, is that um, starting in late June of this year, uh, New South Wales, um, particularly Sydney and, and what they call the Greater Sydney region, which includes uh, a number of suburbs, uh, a number of towns um, outside of Sydney, we were placed into lockdown because of an outbreak of COVID-19. And initially it was going to be two weeks and then they extended it to another two weeks, and then once we got to the end of uh, July, then they said it was going to go through to the end of August. Um, uh, and then once we get closer to August, now it's going to go through to September. Uh, and now we are going into October, if not maybe November. So uh, this has been a rolling situation here in New South Wales. Um, so um, uh, given that I am in, in the greater Sydney region, that has uh, placed enormous restrictions on my movement, uh, things that I can do outside of the home. Um, and, and there are millions of Australians, uh, millions of people in my state who have been caught up in this whole uh, policy that the government has unrolled. Now, in relation to house arrest, uh, so for, for, for a 10-day period from about I think around the 1st of September to through to the 10th, I was placed under house arrest. Now, in New South Wales, we have a policy um, in that uh, if, if you are exposed to COVID-19, or if you have COVID-19, you must self-isolate. So um, a few Fridays ago, my daughter was at a childcare center, uh, COVID-19 was detected. Um, the following Tuesday, we were notified, we went and uh, picked up our daughter, we went for testing. On the Wednesday, it came back and said that we were negative, uh, which was good. Um, and we thought we were in the clear. We were able to go, uh, uh, you know, about our business. 
But uh, that Wednesday night, uh, the health department of the New South Wales government called um, my wife and I up and said that uh, you, we have classified you as a close contact um, because uh, because your daughter was in the, in the, in the childcare centre where COVID existed. Therefore, we must uh, ask you to self-isolate, which basically means that you have to remain in your home. You're allowed to go into your backyard, uh, but that's essentially it. Um, and if you leave your home, um, you're subject to monetary fines and potentially arrest. Um, so the reason why they have done this is that uh, with the Delta strain, the health officials have put the argument forward that um, even if you test um, early in this 14-day period, so so they basically say that um, you know you can be asymptomatic for potentially 14 days, or you may not even be detected of having COVID for 14 days. That's why you got to self-isolate for that period. But the other thing that they said was that there are apparently some situations where people get tested, they do come negative. But by the end of the 14-day period, they actually test positive for COVID-19. So, so that's why you have to self-isolate for, uh, you know, for, for two weeks. In our case, it was a week and a half. So it's two weeks from the from the point of exposure, um, and they told us to self-isolate about a week, uh, about half a week into the process. And we were told to test on day 12 um, um, to obviously make sure that we didn't have COVID. Uh, and we, obviously, we did that test and came back negative. But they did say that if you fail to go on day 12 for your test, um, we, you would be uh, your house arrest would be extended for a further two weeks. So uh, no, we, we played by the rules, and, um, and and yeah, and so we were so well. I mean, so I knew that it was going to be some form of compliance uh, just to make sure that everyone's following the rules. But um, I think it was on day 11 uh, last Tuesday. Uh, about a week and a half ago, we were um, uh, an unmarked uh, uh, car came with three police officers, um, um, and they just caught us up just to make sure we were complying with the order to self-isolate. Um, and you know, they caught us up. Are you sick? Is everything okay? So, so we said everything's fine. Uh, we haven't left home, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, one of the police officers left their like got out of the car and left some information sheets on our front doorstep uh, about. Uh, about uh, you know COVID nineteen public health requirements etc. Um, but they were in full gear. They were uh, they had firearms. They had tasers. They had uh, handcuffs. So um, so so yeah. So in other parts of Australia, these sort of compliance checks are done by health officials, not the police. Um, but but uh, the, the funny thing is is that or maybe maybe not funny, but the policy framework in New South Wales is is gotten completely out of hand. So there's probably, uh, well, who, kn who knows how many people, but it's in the tens of thousands of people in my state who have been ordered to self-isolate, who don't have COVID, but who may who are suspected of maybe being exposed to COVID. So uh, resources are stretched. Um, and, and, and so, and, and so, you know, rather than actually asking health officials to do this compliance, that's why they've uh, asked the police, and in some cases, they've asked the military um, to come in and actually just put people on the ground to actually assist with, with all, of, all of these compliance activities. Um, so, so yeah. So, I mean, I, I mean, I wasn't, you know, intimidated or anything like that, but I did find it surprising that if you are police and you are doing compliance checks. Um, that that you know whether carrying firearms and tasers are, are actually necessary to do compliance work. But having said that, if they had rocked up to my house and I was in um, if I was in out if I if I was not at home or if I was in the front of my home, uh, you know I would have been arrested um, for for basically not complying with the public health order. So 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 that's what happened um, in terms of the house arrest. Now in terms of the the past week now. Um, I've been very careful to comply with the public health order, and the public health order is largely about restricting of movement. Um, the view is is that if people move around the community, uh, transmission of COVID is more likely, and and this uh, lockdown, even though it's not supported by the World Health Organization, because they say the cost of the economic and social and psychological cost of lockdowns uh, are out, um, outweigh the benefit. Um, uh, the, the 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 view is is that if everyone stays in their home and you restrict transmission, that then then um, you can stop the spread of COVID nineteen from occurring, even though 
COVID has continued to climb um, from, yeah, I mean, it's continued to climb from when we started in late June to where we are today. So we started off with um, maybe, you know, 10, 20 cases. And in the last week, we we're in about 1,500 cases a day. Um, so, so, so it's, it's steadily grown in terms of that level of, of in terms of that level of growth. But um, even though I've complied with the order, um, I have been very vocal on uh, social media, um, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, and uh, in the last uh, few months, I set up um, a Telegram account to get around some of the censorship uh, issues that, uh, uh, that, that 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 do exist. And um, obviously, I want to have my say about government policy. Um, uh, so I think the government has got the policy completely wrong. And I've been very vocal about my views. I mean, the, the risk of COVID-19 is not as dramatic as what we're being told by my government. Um, and the policy response, I don't think, is proportionate to, to the public health risk. And so, so you know, I've been very vocal on, on a whole host of these uh, points. But uh, um, earlier this week, uh, I got an email uh, from someone who I didn't, you know, there was no signature block, but they said, can you give us a call? I gave a call. It was the state intelligence unit of um, the New South Wales Police. They wanted to talk to me about my knowledge of planned protests, uh, and I've never been to a protest, so uh, I mean, why they would call me is, is interesting. But they also um, wanted to know if I had any information about um, any protests that were unauthorized by the government. So uh, basically, I said, uh, you know, uh, th there was a bit of uh, um, uh, controversy last weekend. Uh, a lot of people in New South Wales went to the beach. Uh, so there's a certain part of Sydney that is heavily locked down. Other parts are light touch. A lot of people went to the beach and enjoyed themselves that day. Um, and people were quite upset. So there was a lot of chatter about uh, about protests. And uh, I did put out one tweet along those lines. I think that one tweet caught the interest of police. So um, so beyond that, I have you know no further contact or information. But uh, so I you know, was very open with um, the detective sergeant who who contacted me, um, and I pretty much said you know you know the lines of communication are open. If you want to contact me, call me. I'm happy, always happy to have a chat. And then today uh, I've I've come to Sydney to do some essential work. Um, uh, bo both uh, in terms of some of these interviews, but also some some legal uh, issues I'm involved in, and um, and uh, yeah, the, this morning uh, two police officers uh, came, went to my home looking for me, um, and basically um, my, my wife was not particularly um, pleased with uh, in terms of the visit. So uh, look, uh, I, I called up the police officers; they left their number, and they again they asked me, "Do I have any knowledge or um, information about?" protest do, am i planning to attend any protests this weekend uh, answer to both of those questions is no but um, they refer to me as a person of interest um uh, only all, all because not that they have any suspicion that i've breached the public health order uh, it, i'm only a per per person of interest because um i have been vocal against uh, government policy on social media which is um you know a very dramatic escalation in terms of um in terms of freedom of speech, political liberties. I mean, so so. I mean, uh, I do think that um, you know th there are there are laws, and if you want to challenge those laws, there is a process through the courts. And um, a few weeks ago, there was a there was a court action that I was involved in um, in the Federal Court of Australia around religious freedom. So a lot of uh, religious uh, houses of worship want to open. Um, and under the public health order, they're not allowed to open. So, so that was um, um, some action that I was asked to come in and, and provide some assistance with. Um, so I was involved in that. So yeah, there is a legal process to go through if you want to challenge the laws. And uh, But while the law is the law, I'm, 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 I've tried to comply with the laws to the best that I can. But the fact that um, I'm now getting home visits from the police and uh, you know, the, the police said this is not about intimidation. This is about... Um, uh, proactive community engagement. Uh, so they want to, you know, talk to members of the public and find out what's going on, um, so that they can better understand the issues at play. But, um, but, but, but clearly, uh, you know, I've done nothing illegal. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and again, they have my phone number. So for, the, for them to think that it was um, necessary to for them to come and give give me a, a, a physical visit, I, mean, I think that's a a necessary dramatic escalation in this um, ongoing saga that we're all experiencing here in Australia. There's so much that we need to talk about in what you just covered so uh, quickly. The uh, the whole supposition that 
a person can suddenly find themselves under house arrest because they're being told by officialdom by a phone call, oh, you were determined to be a close contact and therefore you can't leave your home for until we tell you, basically, uh, is is chilling. I mean, the, the, the freedom of people to, to move about who have done no wrong, that sort of thing. You know, it's a different from someone has, you know, been a drunken driver or they've been done some action that's that's a threat to the society or something. But to to just be suddenly informed, oh, take our word for it. You were you were determined to be a close contact and therefore you have to stay at home until we tell you otherwise is uh, should should bring chills to, I think, to people realizing that if that were 100 percent legitimate and necessary, there may be a reason why that would be. Uh, virtuous, but otherwise it can be completely uh, mistaken, misused, misguided, etc. Uh, also, the the questions about you mentioned, uh, you said uh, COVID doesn't need to be as uh, serious as it's being made out to be. That's another whole layered, layered, layered discussion of uh, the available treatments for. Uh, prevention through strengthening the immune system, through nutritional support, through early early uh, medical treatments, We're giving doctors a free hand to to apply uh, pr- uh, well dis- uh, de- demonstrated effective treatments early, so that people don't have to have serious outcomes, uh, and also that young people. You know, you mentioned this whole study from your daughter's preschool or whatever that children are are demonstrated to be, first of all, uh, to fare very well coming through uh, this particular contagion and very unlikely to spread it to others, to each other or to adults, and particularly likely to be harmed by emotionally by lockdowns and masking, all that sort of thing. Just layers and layers. And then this whole, this whole line of inquiry about, do you know anything about protests? In the U.S., we supposedly have a, uh, the right to assemble and to speak, you know, uh, freedom of speech and, and to assemble peaceably. Uh, is there you've you've talked to us in the past about how the Australian Constitution does not have a Bill of Rights like the uh, U.S. Constitution does that uh, that guarantees people's right to assemble and right to free speech, but uh, maybe you could talk about a little that a little bit further. Is why would even if you had been supporting people's right to protest to stand up for their freedom, uh, why would that be um, uh, considered you know? Uh, something that that the police should be involved in, and then lastly, I think you didn't get to it yet, but uh, as far as being clamped, being uh, removed from Twitter, suspended from Twitter. Uh, so first, can you talk to us about that uh, the encroachment on freedom that happens when you're arbitrarily told that you you're a, you were a close, you were determined to be a close contact, and therefore you need to be under house arrest. When it came to that question, done again. So uh, we got a phone call one night, and uh, I mean, I mean, because I have experience uh, having worked in federal parliament. I mean, the next morning I actually looked up the legal instrument, and there is a legal instrument um, that has been signed by the Minister for Health um, that that basically requires um, uh, people to self isolate. Um, now, the the funny thing is, is that the 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 legal order is very specific. So, so it says you must receive uh, the order in writing um, uh, for it to be legal. Now, um, th- now here's the thing. I mean, I didn't want it to. Do, I didn't want it to be like a, a provocateur because uh, police have not been sort of um, uh, amenable to people who have not complied not only with the technical level of the law but with the spirit of what the government's trying to achieve. So. Um, so, so we we didn't actually get anything in writing. We got a phone call, and uh, you know, I spoke to my lawyer then uh, um, the following morning, and I said, "This is the order," and he said, "Technically, you don't have to self-isolate because it hasn't been received in writing." So I actually called up the relevant uh, area of government, uh, and I said, "Well, we got this phone call. I just wanted to make sure that it's authentic, um, and uh, and and if you could provide something in writing so that you know it's all above board, uh, that'd be great." So you know, they confirmed that yes, it was authentic. You are on our list you have to self-isolate but then they basically said well a phone call sufficient now um i mean the funny thing is is that when you speak to um you know phone operators uh, who are bureaucrats most of them just get a script and they follow the script they actually haven't read the legal instrument themselves so um so yeah so i mean i could have played hardball with the government um uh but but but, but eventually it, it actually took the phone four phone calls with with the um relevant contract t- tracing team for them to supply me the order in writing, but they did. 
um, put, supplied in writing, um, um, and, and that is something that is happening. I, I mean, look, the, the, the key point is, is that uh, the New South Wales government in March of last year effectively declared a state of emergency, suspended all sorts of civil rights, um, very much in the similar fashion of what Hitler did in, in 1933. Um, and some people may say that, that, that that's a dramatic comparison, but, but in terms of how much power the government has assumed in, in my state, it is very much on par with Germany. Um, I've had, you know, for example, two weeks ago, I spoke to someone in Sydney who uh, is from Czech, well, who's, who's now from, uh, it's now the Czech Republic, but at the time was the Czechoslovakia. He lived as a teenage boy under communism. Um, his parents lived under the Nazis, uh, uh, you know, from 1930, I think, eight through to 1945 when the Nazis took over Czechoslovakia. And, and pretty much from the stories that he was told from his parents and his, um, you know, uh, uncles and aunts, etc., um, what we're going through in New South Wales is very much similar to what the uh, what the Nazis did. Now, obviously, different context. Uh, we're, we're in a, a pandemic at the moment versus um, versus a totalitarian regime that was that was thirsty for um, territorial conquest in Europe. Um, but uh, but you are right. Um, uh, in Australia, both the federal constitution, but also in the, the state constitution, we don't have a bill of rights. We don't have all of the rights protections that Americans have. And, and obviously, there's a very good reason why the American founding fathers, fathers put those um, uh, rights in, uh, you know, made amendments to the constitution in 1791, because they saw the, uh, the common abuses that were happening in Europe. And they said, well, we've got to make sure that these abuses um, don't happen um, here in America. So, but unfortunately, um, um, if circumstances were to justify that, those abuses that happen in Europe in the 18th century can actually happen here in Australia in the 21st century. So, um, that that that's uh, an unfortunate thing. And uh, uh, I mean, I think a lot of Australians um, have been shocked with how quickly things have escalated. Um, typically. When government wants to implement controversial policy, they'll take it to an election. They will pre-announce it. They'll do consultation. Um, they will do a number of things to get the consent of the governed. Um, that hasn't happened in this lockdown. We've gone from an initial two-week lockdown to a, a full-scale totalitarian state. Um, um, and it's just been effectively uh, said by the Premier um, uh, at these daily press conferences um, and pretty much the, whatever legal instrument they, they have to sign, they just do it by decree. Um, and there's an expectation that we all comply. And so obviously this is where tensions and escalations has, has risen between members of the community and the police, because you know, again, you know, this has never been tested at election. There was no consultation. There was no, okay, you know, what do you think about this? It's just that this is the new world we live in. Um, and, and, you know, uh, you're expected to comply. Now, the the concerning thing I have is is that the um, now the the person who's really driving that in my state is is while it's technically from a legal point of view the politicians, it's actually the chief health officer um, who who's a lifelong bureaucrat. And because the bureaucrat, the politicians keep on saying, well, we're following the health advice. Now, now th this health official. Uh, her name's Dr. Kerry Chant. Um, she seems very fanatical in her views uh, about a range of things that we're not allowed to talk about on YouTube, but she has a history uh, in, in, in promoting certain policies um, even before the pandemic. And I think some of those attitudes have, have come forward. But she basically has said that um, she expects these measures to be in, in place for at least four years. That uh, we're not going to uh, COVID won't be resolved until 2025. Um, so, so in terms of uh, you know uh, injections, uh, booster shots, in terms of um, face masks, in terms of ongoing restrictions in some form or another, um, we do have a policy of um, um, opening up the economy once we hit certain vaccination thresholds. Um, but uh, the government has said they reserve the right that if uh, there is a outbreak in one form or another, that they will go back to the current lockdown policy. And obviously, when you look at what's happening in Israel, uh, which which has one of the highest levels of vaccination in the world, um, they 
as uh, seeing a, a dramatic escalation of cases. So um, while we have the current government, while we have the current health advice coming to the government, um, I, it doesn't seem like we're going to return to pre-pandemic Australia anytime soon. There's so much more. I'm going to try to be very succinct, but uh, over and over again, we talked about this with Alex Newman uh, years ago about how the government is acting like they own your children and they're indoctrinating them in the schools to do a certain thing. And when that doesn't play out well, or when a welfare state doesn't play out well, or when any uh, intrusive policy doesn't play out well, the the prescribed remedy is, well, more of the same rather than, well, that didn't work. Let's do something different. Let's do something smarter. Let's, for example, support the health and wellness of people rather than just locking them down more. Uh, you also, along the way, got suspended from Twitter. Yes, yes. Uh, look, it's, so there was a particular tweet in the last 24 hours that I put up that Twitter did not like. Um, so I've been suspended for seven days. Uh, I can't tweet. I can't retweet. Uh, my, my account is still open, um, so I can still search on Twitter. I can send direct messages, but uh, I've been suspended for seven days from tweeting or retweeting. Um, but I, but I should say that uh, uh, a similar thing happened to me has happened to me a couple of times in the last few months with Facebook, um, and then obviously with LinkedIn, um, they have attempted to permanently suspend my account. Uh, and I've had to appeal and they've accepted my appeals. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, so, um, the ability to share information and to publicly and openly discuss public policy. I mean, I mean, that, that, that is a, um, huge important thing because at the end of the day, if you disagree with the government, how can you remove that government if you if the if the majority wants to take the your country or your state in a different direction well you need to be able to discuss you need to be able to assemble and, and obviously meet and, and 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 exchange ideas you need to be able to um you know take these issue view uh, these policies forward and challenge them in the courts but also in terms of democratic elections so the fact that um now um, very much like um, uh, the U.S. media, we Australia has a highly concentrated media media ownership structure. All of the media companies have fallen into line in pushing one side of the argument. Um, and, and 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 so the unfortunate thing is is that if you have a counter view, um, the mainstream media is not giving that any form of oxygen. Um, and a whole host of uh, platforms where you typically can share that information with other Australians or Americans or people around the world, they're preventing you from doing so. So that's why I am I recently, uh, in the last few months, set up a Telegram uh, group and people can join it, Adams Economics um, on Telegram. I think we're, we've just ticked over 11,000 members and uh, I try to provide uh, up-to-date information all the time about the things I'm seeing and hearing and People in, particularly in Australia, appreciate the updates I'm giving, and uh, you know, people from around the world feel free to join and obviously be part of the community. Now, one more theme that I was just touching on a few moments ago, I'd like to circle back with you because it's it's reared its head uh, very pungently in Australia, and that's the separation, the the state inserting itself between parents and children. There was a fairly public story several weeks ago in the news about how the uh, Australian government was going to bring. I believe it was tens of thousands of school children into a stadium and, and have them vaccinated and the parents were not going to be permitted. And they said, you know, reassuring, oh, don't worry, we'll take good care of the children. We'll have all these experts on hand to make sure that they're not stressed out or anything. What What is going on in Australia that, that parents should be aware of around the world about the imposition of the state between the parents and the children as far as not... Uh, allowing parental involvement, not allowing parental uh, uh, informed consent, and that sort of thing. Well, well, the well, the thing is, is that uh, <laughs> look, it's very funny you mentioned that term, informed consent. Now, um, the the funny thing is, is that, and I'm not sure how many Americans actually understand this, is that because because one of my uh, friends who is is pro the current policy set keeps on telling me that in 1905 there was a decision before the U.S. Supreme Court in which the court said that. Um, state governments in America have the power to mandate every citizen to be vaccinated. So um, there is 
precedence in American law for mandatory vaccination. Now, um, what I would say is, is that the entire legal framework and the political environment changed after World War II because of what happened in some of the concentration camps in, in Europe. So, um, the, the, I mean, obviously, the Nuremberg Code talks about informed consent. Um, that, that's obviously an important principle. And, and so far, while there were some initial discussions about mand like a, a blanket mandatory vaccination obligation on everyone, um, the principle of informed consent has, has remained. But what they have now done is effectively use these lockdowns as a coercion tactic to economically deprive its citizens of an ability to generate income until we hit certain vaccination targets. So basically, we've been told we will be locked down until certain targets are met. So go and get, go get the needle or go get vaccinated. Otherwise, the current policy will so will continue. Now, uh, in previous discussions, done again, we've talked about in the Australian context about we how we've got the largest household debt bubble in Australian history. So uh, now, while I have no debt and I have um, taken all sorts of financial precautions pre-pandemic about given the economic environment, a lot of Australians are in, in a completely different situation. Um, and, and obviously, because the, the type of work I do, I do it from home. And I've been able to, uh, I've been able to navigate all sorts of um, uh, elements that we've been experiencing um, recently. But a lot of other people have work in different industries, um, but also a lot of people are deep in debt, and their economic circumstances don't give them the buffer that, that, that I would have or, or that you would have or others who follow your channel would have as well. So, so that form of coercion has worked. So um, in my state, I think earlier this week, we hit 80% uh, in terms of the, in terms of the, 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 the first dose. Um, and pretty much we, will, we won't be opening up until we hit 70% uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of what they call two jabs. Um, so, um, so, so yes, so, so the unfortunate thing is, is that uh, a lot of people are being forced down this uh, path. And so even though people would technically have informed consent, that consent is being challenged through coercion. Well, even even I don't even know how we can how we can uh, grant that people are being given technically informed consent because informed means they're given information so that they can have a basis to consent. But that information, for example, about the multitude of potential risks and side effects and long term health effects, the the um, information or misinformation people are given about the true severity of consequences of contracting the illness that supposedly is the whole justification for all of this intervention policy uh, without, you know, proper medication, proper nutrition uh, support, that sort of thing. How we can call any of that informed consent is is beyond me currently. But uh, if we could just, before we wrap, I know we're, there's so much more on this and, and you're talking about the economic impacts of it on people as well. And I, I pause to, to make an, a metaphorical analogy, but just as it became extremely controversial in the U.S. about uh, uh, overt uh, extra police uh, pressure that was being put on certain individuals that caused great, great riots and that sort of thing in the U.S., it seems like this pressure to basically put, you know, a lot, you said not allowing much oxygen for certain types of topics or discussion. There's also not oxygen being allowed for people to, to run their lives and have a, to have a livelihood. And that's going to put tremendous financial pressure on families that are already debt burdened. And it could very well accelerate a toppling of the you know, real estate ownership and the transfer of, of uh, you know, foreclosures and causing the transfer of ownership and people losing their homes and that sort of thing. It's, it's food for another discussion we should have. I want to make sure people get a chance, if, if you could let them know how they can find you, if you have any more, any more final thoughts on this discussion from this evening, we'll have to circle back on the economic impacts of it uh, and also, I think, on the, on the psychological and emotional impacts of it uh, in the next time we have you on. And then I want to make sure people know how they can, how they can reach you, how they can find your work, and how they can support you. Sure, sure. Okay, so, so yeah, so in terms of how to contact me, um, 
uh, adamseconomics.com. I mean, like, so I do continue to uh, post information on there. Uh, I do write articles. Um, um, so there was a number of uh, important economic articles over the last few months that I've published, which some of them are deep and technical, but I think they give a good explanation about what's going on. Um, uh, probably the best way to get my views and information unfiltered is Telegram. Um, so uh, people go download tele the, the Telegram app uh, and look up Adam's Economics and Dunnigan just before we started. You found me on Telegram so, so people can find me. If you can't find me, feel free to uh, send me an email or uh, contact me by private message on Twitter uh, and I should be able to give you the link and you can be part of our Growing community where concerned Australians in particular are, are sort of coming together in, in, in terms of sharing sharing information. Uh, and in terms of, I guess, just final thoughts is, I mean, so, you know, if, if the police are watching this interview, uh, I have every intention to follow the legal requirements that, that I'm required to follow. But um, at the same time, I follow the public health order. Uh, the, the public health order doesn't prevent me from pro expressing political views uh, and views about the um, the the scientific, medical, and and legal basis of of the current regime. Um, so you know, I'll I'll continue to speak. I'll continue to um, uh, in terms of share information. Um, you know, beyond that, so uh, you know, I won't uh, do anything that's uh, in contravention from in terms of what we have to comply with. But but but, but we have to press on. I mean, the thing is, is that uh, I mean, a lot of Australians are now thinking about well, what life do we now live? Are we, will we ever be free? What will happen to our children? Um, and there are important principles which took centuries to establish, particularly through England and, uh, and through European bloodshed, which have just been sacrificed um, within weeks. And those principles have to be protected, defended. Um, and, and no doubt, I think that this whole episode will result in um, new political movements about uh, whether it's changes to the con constitution or changes to existing law to make sure that these things can never happen again. Um, and, 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 and I definitely want to be a part of that um, process so that when my uh, children become adults, they, they can live in a free and prosperous Australia knowing that um, we're not going to descend into totalitarianism uh, uh, by, by a few politicians signing some piece of papers within a few weeks. Also, folks, John, you mentioned it earlier. There are certain things we are not allowed to say on YouTube or on other mainstream uh, social media platforms. You people who are joining us here, you're our friends, you're our uh, supporters. You also yearn for freedom and for uh, thriving of our families and our communities and our beloved countries. Please support our work here. We know that uh, we cannot rely on the sustenance that would have come from you know monetary support we could have gotten from these platforms so make sure you support john at adamseconomics.com and you'll also find us not only on youtube but also on brighteon and rumble and soundcloud and soon some additional uh freedom supporting and free speech supporting platforms and uh, you can always support us not only on paypal.me slash reluctant preppers and patreon.com slash reluctant preppers but also uh, just by joining our free newsletter at libertyandfinance.com. Put your name and email address in. Get on our email address. An email list will send you announcements of all of our interviews with John, any of the links to articles that they mention, all of our guests. And uh, John Adams, freedom fighter from Australia, and on behalf of all of the free people in the world, just thank you for joining us here again on Liberty and Finance. Thank you, Don, again for all of your work, and thank you for having me. This week's specials with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments. Austrian Philharmonics. For only $365 over spot. Type 2 Silver American Eagles. For only $725 over spot. And Limited Mintage San Francisco Mint. Type 2 Silver American Eagles. For only $725 over spot. Sold in quantities of 500. Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.